just in the past few days, <coughs> I've just been more so considering Jesus and, and picturing how that the world and the condition of the world was not good. And uh, we, we th I, I was thinking back about uh, the prophets and how you find in Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, you'll find in, uh, different of the minor prophets there in the Old Testament, how they declared that there was a, a coming one. He was coming. He was the Messiah, the, the Savior. Call them, uh, Isaiah called him Emmanuel, the God with us. Giving the Jewish people back then uh, the hope, hope. And, and because they had turned their backs on God, these prophets were going and, and telling them, you know, there's coming one. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. But then it came to the, to the book of uh, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And Malachi, God spoke through these prophets, but as he spoke through Malachi, he spoke of the coming one whose healing was in his wings. And um, he says there's someone that's coming to pave the way, which was John the Baptist, that he came, paved the way for Jesus. He was born six months later after John the Baptist, Jesus was. But if you take note that after Malachi, God was silent for about 400 years, was silent. So the condition of this, of this world was not, not good. It was darkness. The, I'm just picturing you, put, putting a picture for you. And then we find that uh, they were taken over, of course, by, by the Babylonians, the Jews, the nation. And then uh, later on, the Persians, Greeks, they took over. And then they allowed them to go build the temple and to, uh, but it, the temple was never the same as it was when Solomon built it. It was not as big, it was not as glorious. And some of the older people saw that and they weeped when they saw that when they completed the temple that was built. But I believe the temple had to be built because Jesus was coming and he was going to enter into that temple. And uh, he was going to declare what he was called to do, which, he, which Jesus did when he entered the temple. And he says, the anointing of, of the Holy Spirit is upon me. He has, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So when they had built that temple, uh, I was studying this out and I found that uh, the, they, they were created the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And a lot of their, the bloodline was supposed to be the, the, the priest, but it got all messed up. And they were, different ones were appointing them own selves, but it was not appointed of God. So it brought a lot of confusion. Confusion. And so, and it brought division. So that it was divided. That's why they had the Pharisees and the scribes and uh, was it Pharise Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, and all them. And, and they were divided amongst each other. You know, one believed in the resurrection, the other side didn't believe in the resurrection. And um, so when, now, now picture this. The Roman government was in control. They took over. They dominated. They dominated the world. And so the Jews were, had not, did not have their country. They were not in their country. They were not in control whatsoever. So therefore, when Herod came in, and uh, he, was, he was really not called in that position, but he, 
self-appointed. I think I'm thinking of something of today. We have a lot of people that appoint themselves. I really believe there's a whole lot of preachers that appoint themselves to be preachers. I fought it. I didn't want to be. Usually the ones that fight are the ones that are called. <laughs> Uh, Moses fought it. You find different ones in the, in the Bible that they would fought it and God would use them. Well, I fought it, and I fought it a lot because I, did not, I was the kind of person who did not communicate. I was not a very com good communicator. I could not uh, talk with people. I struggled with one-on-one, -on -one, let alone talking to a whole group of people. And um, I, said, I was thinking, God, I, I don't have all the gifts of the Spirit. I don't have all the callings that a lot of preachers and, and some of these preachers that are very, they're very, what you call, um, charismatic. I mean, they just, and they just draw people. And, and I'm not that kind of a person. You know, I don't just draw people. And so God, God says, I'm going to use you. And so he placed me in this position. But I look around, as now that he's placed me in this position, I look around and, and, I, and I have a tendency to look at the body of Christ and the temperature where it's at today in what we're living in. And the way it's set up, it's set up in the same manner as it was when Jesus came the first time. It was very chaotic. It was dark. And it almost sounds like God is silent because there's a lot of stuff that's being that's not being uh, corrected. People are, are doing their own thing. They're, they're establishing their own religions. There's religions after religions. In America, Christianity was the main religion here in America. And we saw the power that America has become. As, as a result, and then now we invite other religions to come upon our land to practice their religion. And, a, and God had warned the children of Israel. He goes, if you do that, there will be pricks or thorns in your side, pricks in your eyes. It's going to be very irritating. And they're going to cause you to move away from me and serve other gods. We have that today in America. We have people that are getting into serving other gods. They say, there's nothing wrong with that God. But I always say this. Look at what their gods that they're serving, that they brought here on our land. Look at, look at what their God brought them, of what country they came from. And tell me how blessed that country has been. It's not been. Many of the religions from India have come here. You got one of them is yoga, very well accepted. Uh, some Christians are involved with yoga, and you know it has. He says, "Oh, you know that's an exercise and all. Why don't you exercise the word? Why don't you exercise my meditating upon the word? You know, think upon those things." God has already given it. See, uh, God was here before yoga. Yeah. He says, oh, it brings relaxation. So does God's Word do. Amen. Meditate on it and you'll find a relaxation that will come to you. You'll find a peace that the world tries to give, that God has gives to us, that far surpasses the peace that's here on this earth. But the only reason why is because the pulpits of America are not teaching that. There are Christian yoga things, There are Christian yoga? Are you trying to correct me in front of this? Okay. If you have the yoga and use it and not to do the, all the kinds of movements that they, they do, they invite other gods, okay? But if you have the yoga, that will go. I don't like to call it yoga, really, because <laughs> of where it comes from, the stem where it comes from. If you go and, and you get it where you put your mind and you put the things on the things that are, are true, honest, lovely, pure, just, good report, think on those things, yeah, think on those things. Amen. But you don't have to call it yoga. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
It's a mid Middle Eastern religion that has come here. And, uh, and, and I know of a family member that actually uh, got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit and into the yoga aspect, but went the other way and is not doing any of the things of the Christian. You know, you can't get anything that is going to take you away from the focus of what Jesus is, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so we have a whole lot of this stuff that's come in. They had a lot of stuff already. A lot of other religions that were beginning even there during that time before when Jesus showed up. This is the reason why when Jesus showed up, they could understand him. Religion itself could not understand him. And so therefore, that's why he said, yeah, it's so true when Jesus quoted this. He said, in Isaiah, it's so true. You have eyes, but you see not. You have ears, but you see, but you hear not. Because of the hardness of your heart, you're spiritually dead. So when you can you can follow other religions, but you can still be spiritually dead. Because spiritual life can only come from the one who created us. Everything else is synthetic. It's not the real. Praise the Lord. Now I want you to turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. I mean chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And I want to just read a portion here of an account of when the, when the angel came to the shepherds and appeared. Now, now picture where, the, where their civilization was at during that time. The Jews did not have their country. They were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for the coming one. Okay, they were looking because they were believing that they were going to get their country back. That's where their mind was at. Now, dark place, 400 years, silent, all of a sudden. Verse 8 says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, Say behold. behold. Say it right. Behold. Say it like you mean it. Behold. See, I really believe now you picture the angels. Behold. behold. Now there's, there's, pay attention, look and see. That's what the angels were saying. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people which I entitled this message joy offered joy has been offered to the world and here I look at this scripture great joy which will be to all people for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, say suddenly. suddenly. Wow. You look at the, a lot of the suddenlies that take place in the Bibles. There was another, there was a suddenly that took, took place in the day of Pentecost. When Je Jesus had told them to wait in the city of Jerusalem until you and do the power from on high. And then as they were all in one accord, there was 120. I mean, he spoke to more than 120, but only 120 showed up. That's the way it is today. And they went there, 120, and then suddenly, like a rushing wind, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a suddenly here. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. A multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. Wow. 
jump over to verse 20. After they saw the baby and everything, they witnessed it all. The shepherds witnessed it. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as, that, as it was told them. They witnessed it. They saw it. They glorified God. They praised God. This is the place where the church needs to be. We need to be in a place of praise and worship all the time, all the days of our life. God has released His peace. God has released His joy. We get to experience that joy and peace within our lives for the rest of our lives. I, th I just heard a song just a while ago coming down the mountain. Never heard of it, but it was uh, it was talking it was it was singing about how Mary had wrapped up Jesus, swaddling swaddling clothes, wrapped him up. But picture, he wrapped him up as a gift to the world. Amen. Amen. As a gift to the world, he's my gift. He's my gift. I appreciate him. I think about this. And I was pondering this. I was meditating on this last night before I went to sleep. And I, and I was thinking, God, I'm just picturing the angels that came to the shepherds to give them good news. Society was not in a good place. Religion was all messed up. The way God had created the church to be, it was not there. The way, the format that he had set out, even the temple, everything, the priests, all that, the way it needed to be laid out, it was not laid out the way it was supposed to be. That's the reason why they were not producing signs and wonders. That's why there was not healings that were taking place. Certain prophets that God used to bring forth the healings, but a lot of, a lot of the others and the church were not doing any of that at all. What's happening today? Most of our churches in America are not producing the signs and the wonders and the miraculous. Every Christian church, every Christian church ought to be healing the sick. Not only spiritually, but mentally, emotionally, physically. See, the church of Jesus Christ has, has been set up to meet the needs of humanity. And because we've fallen short, we have fallen short, the only reason why is because there is sin in the camp. God is cleaning up His church. The Bible says that judgment shall begin in the house of the Lord. See, judgment is already out there, but it's going to begin in the house because we are supposed to be the ones that set, that set the bar. We're supposed to be the ones. But we got those that are in church that are compromising, that I have sin. You say, well, everybody sins. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Everybody sins. Yeah, we're all sinners. We're all going to sin. Oh, yeah. Now, what kind of victory is that? What kind of peace is that? Have you ever noticed that when, if whenever you sin that you don't have peace? And you know you're sinning, but you don't have peace. And you keep on sinning, and no peace. And you're looking for peace. You're not going to get it. So it tells me something. He says, peace, goodwill toward men. See, what did God create the church to be? To, to, to exercise His goodness to us. And what does His goodness bring? His goodness brings us to repentance. Because what His goodness does, that He has set up, it exposes all that which is not good in me. So it keeps me clean. And it keeps an examination upon me. That I don't have to look around to see who's sinning. I'm looking, I'm looking into me, making sure that I don't sin. Because everybody else is responsible for themselves. God is cleaning the church. I'm telling you right now, prophetically, God is cleaning up His church. Amen. And the fire has been turned up. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It's all right. Because the fire 
He burns up all the scum that's been placed upon the gold the way God has created us. It's like, it's like go ahead, God. Burn. Let the fire burn in me. Whatever displeases you, let it burn. Praise God. God is looking for people that are hungry. Hungry. Not just come to church whenever they feel like it, but they come to church because they're hungry. Amen. See, when you're not hungry for things of God, you're hungry for something else that you are filled up with that ha where God has no room for you. Or you have not made no room for Him. Just like when he was born. They said there was, no, there was no room in the end. It was all filled up. And that sounds like our lives oftentimes. We're so filled with other things in life that there's no room for the Son of God to live within us. No room. See, notice, they were looking for a room. People say, well, they couldn't afford it. No, they were looking for a room. And they found no room. It was packed out. So he was born in a stable. And here, and here's the other thing as I was pondering last night. Here the, God made an announcement of his son. He was presented to the world. And the world did not receive him. The Bible says in, for, in John 1 that he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. Today we have many that are not receiving him. So what do they have? They have religion. They have a form of religion. That's what happened when Jesus showed up the first time. They had a form of religion. There was religious things that were set up. They went to the, the ritual stuff that they, that they go through. Like what we have today. They just go through the rituals. That's not church. See, needs, are not, needs don't, are not met when we go through rituals. You can find a different, different churches that they just go through it. They just say their prayers. But people's lives are not being changed. Jesus showed up to change lives. Amen. So what part don't we see? No, the way church has been set up, it's been set up by man, not by God. What kind of church do we have? Do we have a man church or do we have a God church? A Bible church. Praise the Lord. But as many, watch this. The king came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of the living God. Raising up for us to be sons and daughters of the living God. I serve that God. I serve that Jesus. I serve that and commit my whole life to Him. As a result, in exchange, I get to experience joy. Joy. And let me tell you how joy is going to come. Look at John chapter 15. I wrote this down. Joy comes from God through the spirit of man whose life has been totally surrendered to him. What is that saying? I mean, in fact, I'm just going to read that again. Joy comes from God through the spirit of man whose life has been totally surrendered to Him. Or the surrendered part is full obedience. Oh, nobody obeys God to the fullest and all. Oh yeah, I do. There's others around that do. Amen. But in order to fully obey, you have to be fully surrendered. Amen. Uh, and and what, is it, what is it that we surrender? Yes. Huh? Everything. Everything of who you are. 
everything. That's total surrender. Now, when I totally surrender my life, and it's not religion, I totally surrender my life, I get to experience the joy of the Lord. Amen. Does that mean that you're going to walk around all happy and smiley every single day you get up and all? No. That's called happy. We talked about that last week. Happy. Happy is a decision that you make. Happy, you're going to probably make a decision based upon your environment. You're going to see, how's your day? Well, my day just got started, so I'll see what the day will, do, what the day will bring me. Now you are, you are bowing yourself to the circumstances and the problems of life. And I'll tell you, by the end of the day, you're not going to be happy. I don't even have to prophesy that. You just won't. <laughs> See, you have to start off your day to say, you know, today is the day that God has made. I'm breathing today. I get to live another day today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, and so therefore, I will rejoice Amen. and be glad in it. Amen. See, I'm not going to wait to get happy. I'm just going to rejoice. And I'm going to keep on rejoicing. See, because I choose to tap in to my spirit, to live off of my spirit, because joy can only come to our spirit. Because joy is a spiritual force. Amen. Praise the Lord. So therefore, the world's out there trying to find joy, and it can't find it. You know, they only get little, little touches of, 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 of a measure of peace, but it only lasts for the Christmas season. Have you noticed? You know, people seem to be a little happier, and, you know, and they seem to be a little bit up, and, and they seem to be in a little bit in the giving spirit. You know? And, uh, but what happens after Christmas is over? Why can't they stay there? Because it's something that you can't remain unless you're surrendered. See, we, you're no, we're no different from anybody else out there. Oh, it's Christmas time. You're, you know, we're going to be happy. This is tis the season to be happy. Fa la 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 la. <laughs> You know, it's almost like we're trying to get, be convinced singing these songs to convince ourselves when I don't have to be convinced. I get to experience Christmas 365 days out of the year. So do you. So do you. But I'm going to show you something that you're going to have joy even when you're going through the hard things of life. Okay? It's when you're not smiling. But it's but it but it's okay. So you look at you look at John 15, and you find in verse uh, verse nine it says this. Here's total surrender. This is total surrender now. Uh, as the Father, Jesus is speaking. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, if you keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, does it say that? If you keep my commandments, condition, it's conditional. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Verse 11. It's connected. These things I have spoken to you that my, what? Joy. joy. Say joy. 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 May remain in you and that your joy may be full. Amen. Amen. My joy becomes your joy. His joy becomes my joy. Amen. Oh. But what is it connected to? Now you find the reason why you're not experiencing joy 365 days out of the year. If you keep my commandments. Obedience. I can only be obedient when I'm fully surrendered. Amen. See how it bypasses religion? 
Religion is like, in fact, when religion hears stuff like this, they go, oh, this is over with, I can go home, I'll get something to eat. That's when you're religious. You're just religious. I could never be religious. I was raised in religion. I could never be religious. It's boring. Amen. See, what I'm sharing with you is life. Amen. Jesus said that. Jesus, just, Jesus said, He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So He says, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. So if we're not experiencing the life of God, guess what the enemy is doing to you? He's stealing, killing, and, dest and, and eventually destroy you. So anybody here not serving God, you're serving the enemy automatically. Oh, I never had a pastor talk that way to me before. Well, you're getting one. <laughs> Only reason why they get talked that way is because they, they love you. When a preacher talks this way, they love you. Amen. Thank you. See, Jesus wasn't in there to try to get all kinds of, of, of recognition. As a matter of fact, one day he was over there. He had a whole multitude following him. And then as they were following him, he, didn't, he turned around and looked at them. He says, unless you take up your cross, deny yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciples. And then walks off. It's not very popular. That's the reason why Jesus would not be invited today in the 21st century. Would not be invited in most of our churches in America. Because that's the way he would talk. A lot of preachers today have left off the red letters. Because Jesus was too strong. They came to Jesus one time. The, the, his disciples. Hey, he... Um, his board members, you know, they came. And he said, hey, uh, you, uh, you were a little bit too strong for them. You know, they got, they got offended. <coughs> oh, let them, let them alone. Let them alone. He said this, blessed is those that, don't, that hear me and don't get offended in what I say. He goes, he goes, they're blind. Leaders of the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. Wow, that's not what we expected from Jesus. <laughs> See, that's not popular. That's the reason why, by the time Jesus got going to get after after this, when he entered into the gates of Jerusalem for the last time before he was going to die, he had a whole bunch of people that were praising him because this is what they had in their mind. They had in their mind that he's coming as he's coming to save them to get them out of the rulership of Rome, so they can get their country back. They didn't see the bigger picture. And then when they saw him, and they saw what was going on, and then when they arrested him, and they all left him, because it was not according to plan. The plan of man. And then he goes, and he dies on the cross. Let's see if he's really the Son of God. Let him save himself. <laughs> Religious people are talking that way. People today have no fear of God. No fear of God. If you had a fear of God, you'd straighten out your life. But you live. I mean, when somebody comes around you and they find you're a Christian, so, and they've already done a bunch of cussing or whatever, and they say, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I says, they've already offended God. You didn't offend me. You offended the God that I serve. That's all. You better get it right with Him, not with me. You don't apologize to me. You apologize to Him. I'm just His representative. That's it. You can't hurt me. Praise the Lord. See, Jesus said, uh, the servant is not greater than his master. He goes, they'll receive you. They'll re if they receive me, they'll receive you. But if they reject me, they'll reject you. Guess what? They do the same thing today. You tell them the truth. You tell them and you start exposing. See, truth exposes a person's life. And they don't like the exposure of their life. You, uh, you go, don't, don't judge me. What do you mean don't judge you? What I'm telling you is what's judging you. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you the truth. You don't realize the truth is judging you. Jesus said one day, he goes, now you have no covering now because the truth has been ministered to you. You've got nothing to cover yourself with. 
People today are still trying to cover themselves with fig leaves. Like Adam and Eve. God says, no, no, you can't cover yourself. That's not sufficient. You can't cover yourself with fig leaves. I got to go kill an animal. Somebody's got to give up their life. Shed their blood. And they got the skin of the animal and cover them. Until Jesus, the Son of God, when John the Baptist saw him walking, walking up to get baptized in water, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And that was the last time they couldn't, they did not do any kind of sacrifices whatsoever. Because he was the true sacrificial Lamb of God. To take away the sin of the world. He dealt with sin. And we walk around as Christians. What an insult to the Son of God. We walk around as Christians. Well, I'm still a sinner saved by grace. How can you be a sinner? Our sinning life was our identity. Jesus says, if any man be, or God's word says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. My old nature has passed away. What has he given me? He's given me His nature. And His nature, there is no sin. His nature is righteousness. 2 Corinthians was at 5, 21 says, And that He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. He took on my sin so He can give me His righteousness. And I did nothing to deserve that. That's why... That's why this is a good life. Amen. You're still a sinner? No. Have I sinned in the past? Sure. But you know what the blood does? Wipes it off. Thank you, Lord. You know what mercy says? You never did it. Hallelujah. You know what grace says? I give you the ability to walk in obedience to my word. Amen. Wow. I'm ready to get broken right now because I'm, I'm speaking out of appreciation of what God has done in my life. I appreciate this life. I, I just, just, you know, we've been through a lot of stuff. We've been through a lot. We were just talking about it that, like, yesterday, my wife and I. You know, if she's not around, it seems to be this way. We've been married, what, 46 years? And it seems like if she's not around, it's like, I feel like I'm missing something. Amen. Something. Amen. And she goes, oh, <laughs> I just want some points there. No. <laughs> and, and, but it's true. And, and then my daughter says and la lays it out and said the same thing. She didn't know we knew that. But she said the same thing. It's just that you both can't operate without each other. You're one. Can't help it. I mean, it doesn't mean that I can't be independent and do, make, my, make decisions and stuff like that. But it's, it still feels like something's missing. Something's missing. That's God. God does that. God brings those things. And now, does, is she the one that gives me the joy? No, no. Makes me feel happy. I can be joyous. But joy comes from God. It doesn't come from your spouse or your friend. It doesn't come from that. Joy is a spiritual force. Joy is spiritual. You can't get it natural. I don't care if you get high and loaded and all this stuff. And, and uh, Many of us have done that. And all. Yeah, did you ever get the joy? You didn't get it. You didn't get it. You just tripped out. That's all. <laughs> You know, and it left you more empty than before. <laughs> See, so God comes to give me joy. Fill my life. So I'm fulfilled. Amen? Look at, look at this. Uh, look at Romans chapter 5. Joy is a hope. Joy is hope. For the believer who walks through the trials of life, revealing God's love. Wow. Really? Yeah. So how do you know if you have joy? 
How do you know if you have joy? When you're facing the struggles of life. When you're being challenged at everything, every time you turn, it says, man, what is going on? I feel like I'm getting hit. I'm getting hit all over the place. Boom, this is happening. Things are just not working out. Here, now joy can manifest itself. See, you can go and look at it and say, you know what, all hell can break loose. It's okay. I mean, I don't like it. I don't like it, but it's okay. You know why? You can't take joy from me. And, and joy has been birthed inside of me and in you if you're born again. When you're born again of God's Spirit, you got all the fruits of the Spirit. All of it. So now, I recognize the joy when I'm going through the things of life. So when, I'm not, I, when it's hard to smile, and you can't smile, and you're pondering some things, I can stop and think and ponder upon my Savior. Jesus said when the disciples came one day and they were excited because he had sent them out to go heal the sick, to raise the dead. See, that's, what, that's the commission that God has called us. So he called the disciples to do it. He was training them. And then he come back they were all excited. They were all excited. Yeah, Jesus, man, the devils are subject to us. Whoa, we're bad. <laughs> Jesus says, don't rejoice over that. I've seen Satan like lightning. Just, he's gone. That's it. That's nothing. He's a piece of cake. He goes, here, this is what you rejoice over. Rejoice that your names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what you rejoice in. So now, when the devil's throwing all kinds of stuff at you and you're faced with challenges and responsibilities of life, what you do is that you got to tap into joy and just be reminded that where joy comes from, that I'm saved, I'm filled with God's Spirit, I have been chosen, God has adopted me into His kingdom, I am the righteousness of God. When the enemy comes to try to condemn me, he can't condemn me, he can't put no shame on me, because is there no shame in God, in God? And look in verse 5, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith. I'm justified. Okay? All my debt has been canceled. So, wow, but I got debts, you know, I got a house mortgage, you know, I got a car payment and all that stuff. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at that. That don't bring joy. <laughs> In case you're wondering, right? See, so what I have to do, when I, you go face the responsibility, do what you need to do, allow God's wisdom to work with you and work through it, but get, don't live there. Don't live there. Because you're going to go to sleep with all that worry, and you'll find it's very hard to go to sleep. Then when you wake up, you'll have it in your mind again. That's the wrong thing to have in your mind. How are you going to experience joy? What you do is do, make your decisions, do what needs to, and, fa and face your responsibilities, decide what you're going to do, and then go back to being reminded that I've been justified. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. Let me just sit on his lap and just worship him. And let me just praise him. Come on, just be real. Come on, just be real. You can't praise him and worship him when you're going through it. Well, now you're talking about you're, you're talking about feelings. We're not talking about feelings. We're talking about a spiritual force that is only activated. Joy, peace, all this is only activated through faith. Amen. Faith doesn't consult our feelings. Faith just believes what God said. Now, how many can get my faith to believe that? Stick your nose to the book until you believe it. Amen. That's how faith comes. Hear the Word of God. Every week, hear God's Word. I don't see how people can make it without even going to, going to church, missing week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, missing it. How do you do it? I can't. Amen. 
Guess who else didn't? Jesus, the Son of the living God, showed up every Sabbath day. What makes us... Are we better then? No. no. I'll tell you right now. Those that are doing very... In and out, in and out, are not making it. Because you can't make it alone. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Amen. Well, I'm drawing from God when I'm by myself, and when I and so I'm just I'm praying and I'm reading the Word of God and all that. Now we become selfish. We're supposed to not only receive from God, we're supposed to give what God gives to us. And this is what I'm talking about. 365 days, you give. As you receive, you give. Freely have you received, freely give. That's what Jesus said. Yes. So you give. So now, you can only give when you're around others. What can you give them? Are you supposed to give them money? No, well, no that's not. That's only part. How about how about giving them giving them uh, a, a word of encouragement? So glad that you're here. You're, you're, you're such a blessing. Amen. You know, I just love it when you just show up. You know, there, there's just something. There's something about it that makes me feel so good. Now you tell somebody that is like. Wow, really? They could be like this, and you're telling them, you're, you're shooting all this to them. They're just like, they're starting to come out. See, cause, because all those good words tears down negativity. It tears down the strongholds of your, uh, of your mindset. Tears it down. That's what the Bible calls it, the weapons of our warfare. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What, is, what are the pulling down? What are the weapons? God's word. What is it combating? The strongholds of words, the words that, that you allow to stay in your head, they produce a stronghold. And the only, thing to, the only way to overcome it is to get the word of God and believe God's word, operate in faith, and to tear down those strongholds. Amen. So now what do you begin to see? I begin to see I'm his son. God, is lo God loves me, man. He's in love with me. Man, God favors me. You start seeing it. You start seeing God just loving on you. Wow. And what happens? Joy just flows. Eventually it gets on your face. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Look at this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have what? Peace. What did the angel declare to, to the shepherds? Peace. Peace. Peace has been presented to the world. Here it is. Come on, shepherds. Get excited. Come on, world. Get excited. A Savior has been born. Amen. Who has come to redeem. To buy us back because the enemy had his hold upon humanity. Jesus came and bought us back. Adam sold us out. Jesus bought us back. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, if he bought us back, we don't have a right to do and live our own life. See, because when we live our own life, that's where God brought us out of to bring us into. He didn't say, oh, now that, you're, now that you're free, you can go live your own life however way you choose. God didn't say that. God didn't say that. He says, do, here, here's my word. Read it, meditate, pray it, study it, get it in your spirit, and do it. Amen. That's faith. I don't feel like doing it, just do it. I don't feel like praying, just pray. I don't feel like reading, just read. I don't feel like meditating on his word, just meditate. Amen. Amen. People know how to be depressed. Why? They chose it. That's right. 
Depression is a choice. We can, we can, we've done this. We invite a family member and, and just say, let's go out and let's go have, get something to eat. He says, don't want to. Come to find out, uh, they were able to. They didn't want to. Why? Depressed. Depressed. Christmas season even. Depressed. How do you get a person out of that? You can't. They have to choose it. Amen. Now you can go in there and try to break things off and then break off, but now they're going to have to walk it. Because you can break people out and have them have a measure of freedom, but they can go out of these doors and then walk right back into depression again. Why? Choose it. You know why? They believe more of what is in their head than what God's Word says. He says He comes to give peace, but you too choose chaos instead. He comes to give you joy, and you go and you choose sadness instead. Well, if God wanted to do what He wanted to do, then He would just do it. He wants to do it, but He can't do it because He has to go through us. God, you know, that's sad, but that's the way it is. God, God has to be invited every day. Every day, God has to be invited. You know what? He's invited every day in my life. I go in. I don't feel a thing. I go in and pray. Myself, I just go in there in my office at home, and I just go in there and I just meditate on God and just worship God. I don't feel nothing, but you know what? I sense something in my spirit. Eventually, some tears come to my physical eyes, but I'm doing that time, I'm being broken. What is God, what is God doing? I, I'm, I'm giving Him permission to break everything that displeases Him. Because I want to be a, a well-pleasing son to Him. I want to be His mouthpiece. The things that I speak, speak in church, speak over at the mission, I want it to be God coming out and saying these words. I don't want them to be my words. And that's the reason why God has even said, He says, even if, it does, even if they reject you, you're still going to speak my words. I will speak your words. I will, as long as it's the truth, I will speak your truth. Even if they reject me because I got to look at it and I cannot take it personally. Because if they're rejecting me, they're rejecting you, Lord. I believe that's the reason why a lot of people don't want to be a witness. They don't want to. They don't want to tell their family members about Jesus and stuff. You know, it's not very popular. What do you want to do? You want you? Are you looking for popularity? You're already not popular, anyways. <laughs> so why not just tell them the truth? They already don't like you, anyways. So just tell them. You don't lose anything. <laughs> Because you haven't lost anything. You don't lose anything. But you'll gain favor with God. Yes. Now notice, this is what joy, this is this is what joy goes through. And it gets you through it because last week I said, the joy of the Lord is your what? The joy of the Lord is your what? Come on, say it. The joy of the Lord is your it doesn't sound like strength to me. <laughs> Come on. The joy of the Lord is your? Strength. The joy of the Lord is your? Strength. Okay. Don't yell at me. No. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is our strength. Okay, now here. Watch. Now, you may not want to have joy after this. <laughs> I want it. I pray to others. Through whom? Oh, wait, wait. Let me start this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ. Okay, we have peace. No other way. Through whom also, oh, this comes along, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand rejoicing and rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. Oh, oh, wow. 
we rejoice because we become as we're walking with him and we're walking in peace we're walking in joy we're rejoicing in that joy as we're being transformed into the image of Christ and we become a reflection of Jesus upon planet earth wow and we're being changed from glory unto glory unto glory you look better you even get better your behavior gets better now we haven't arrived there's a work that's happening this is the reason why this must happen in our lives it says and not only oh conjunction is connected here what else that but we also glory in tribulations we re re rejoice we rejoice in tribulations how many can actually say I rejoice in my tribulations <laughs> okay I'm speaking to the right people <laughs> I saw I didn't see much of a response, so we rejoice. We rejoice. What is this? Uh, in in tribulations. Why? This is why I do it. Knowing that tribulation produces something. It produces perseverance. And perseverance it produces character. And the character, that's the change of character, produces hope. I met, when I met my wife, I was a, a character. Okay. 46 years later, that character has changed. I am not that same. No, notice he's nodding your head now. I am not that same person. And now, I like it. Amen. In fact, I love it. But we went through a whole lot of things in our lives. A lot of things that would, a lot of, most of the time, would have caused a separation and divorce of the things that we've gone through in life. This did not come easy. What made it harder is when you, you lose focus. When the Bible says, set your affections on those, thing, those things that are above. When I would lose focus, that's when it got hard. Every time. It got hard. So, when I got to a good place where I'm just sick and tired, because my, many Christians are not sick and tired yet. But when you get a place where you're just sick and tired of being that same old, same old, same old person, then you go and you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to rejoice in what I have to go through. God, whatever I need to go through, I may not like it. It's okay. You know better than, you know better than, I, than I do. You know what I need to go through. And so what tribulation does, it exposes your character. See, it brings you out. See, it brings out when you react, how you react. If you react angry, if you act ugly, if you react stubbornness, if you start throwing words, that's your character that needs to change. God's not putting shame on us. God's not putting guilt on us. God doesn't do that. God is just helping us to point out because a while back you just said, God, do what I need to do to change. Oh, okay. Now you got to go through tribulation. Because that's the only way. If everything goes good, you're going to be all right. You're going to say, oh, my life's pretty good. And you're not going to change. You're still going to be your ugly self. Okay. Because we can be ugly. All right. So see what God wants to do. He wants to change ugly. So we try to do everything we can to try to appear good in front of people and public and all that. But you know what? Husbands and wives know how you really are. Thank God that they, they conceal some stuff. They don't put you out there. I thank God my wife did that. She would, you know, things I went through and I felt so sorry afterwards and all. And I says, oh my God, you know, she put this stuff out there. She never did. That's a good part. That's a good strength on her part. Amen. She could have, and, and she knew, she could have put me out there and, and, and threw me under the bus a hundred, hundred thousand times or something, you know. Threw me under there and I, I would have been all messed up. But you know, didn't do that. 
and it gave me a chance to grow up and allow God to take me through the character change that needed to be. And when every time that ugly would come out, I knew I had to do something about it. I was responsible. Even if my wife, which I thought my wife was a cause of it, I still could not put the blame on her. I had to act and say, okay, why am I acting the way I'm acting? Why am I allowing, let's say what she does, how, why am I allowing that to happen in my life? Why am I allowing? I gotta find out what that is. I gotta find out what the root cause is and uproot it. Get it out. Isn't that what John the Baptist said about Jesus, that he's going to uproot? And that's what he does. He uproots all those all that garbage that we were feeding off of that messed up, that got our character the way we are. So we have to go through the tribulation. So guess what I'm going to do? Well, I'm going through it. Okay, God, I, I thank you, Lord, because you know what? Here, while I'm going through it, your word says this, Hebrews, it says this, whom a father loves. Oh, yes. He chastises. He corrects me. You know, so while I'm being corrected, I look at it and turn it around. And I don't go, like a lot of people will do this. They'll go, God, why are you allowing this to happen? No. Why don't you look at it and say, God, what do you want to show me through what I'm going through? Amen. Because you know what? You're showing me that you love me. That you love me. You show me that you love me. I said, so you stay focused on love. Now watch. I'm getting ready to close. Ready? You can tell your flesh, I'm getting ready to close. He's <laughs> getting ready to close. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, live off your spirit. <laughs> Your spirit doesn't want to close. Your flesh does. <laughs> oh, Pablo. Something else. Okay. Verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Amen. Wow. So what's happening? What's going on? As my character is being changed and I'm rejoicing, I'm, I'm, I'm in the right attitude and rejoicing and letting God do what needs to change in my life and doing something about changing it and walking by faith, not by feeling, but walking by faith when I'm doing it to change me. Okay, now, what is it doing? I have such great hope because you know what? I'm not going to stay this way. I'm going to be different. I'm not going to be the same character anymore. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a, you know, whatever, if you're a wife, I'm going to be a better wife. I'm going to be a better mother. I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to be a better worker. I'm going to be a better uh, friend. You know, I'm going to be better. I don't know of anybody here that doesn't want to be better. Huh? Nobody here. But you know what? A lot of people want to be better and get things, good things, and want to be blessed and all, but they sit and do nothing about it and thinking that it's just going to come on me. Why? Because I'm a Christian. No, it doesn't. You have to go after it. You have to do everything what the Bible says for you to do. If the Bible says don't forsake the assembly of yourselves, then do it. Because it, do, it does it for a purpose. What happens? You feed off of one another. You bring encouragement to one another. You nurture one another. And if there's things that need to be changed within the church, let God bring the change. Let Him. If there needs to be judgment coming to the house of God, let Him. Let Him. I'd rather be judged now then when we face God. So you know what I do? I judge me. You know what most people do? They judge one another. We've been not called to judge. We've been called to present truth. That's all. Let truth do the judging. And if people say, don't judge me, then t just tell them, I'm not judging you. Here, the truth is. Evidently, somewhere deep inside, you know to do good, but you don't do it. You know what is right, but you're not doing it. So what I would like to encourage you with is quit running. 
faster you stop, the faster you learn not to run, the better off you're going to be in your life. So you're going to be able to experience what the, what, what the, when the shepherds, or when the angels came to the shepherds and said to them, peace, goodwill towards men. The, the shepherds went off and they went and they began to rejoice. And you know what? I didn't get a chance to get this scripture because I saw your flesh. I could see it. I, I could pick things up too. You know, the thing is this, is that Peter, you'll find it there in 1 Peter, it says, it says that there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Here's this. I'm talking to you about joy that you can have through Christ. It has the only way through Christ. But I can't experience I can't express it to you. It cannot be explained. Peace and joy from God cannot be explained. They can't. This is where people that are very intelligent have a hard time with. The wise, the wise people, the wise that came to Jesus, they were, they were seeking Him. They are still wise seeking today. We got the most intelligent people today. We got one that was, I forget his name. He was in a wheelchair. Very intelligent, intelligent, intelligent. Hawkins. Hawkins. People look to him. Mental health field, all these people, they look to him. All these books he wrote. And as far as I've seen throughout, he died without God. You could be so wise and miss it. Because God doesn't come through the senses. You can't figure it out. You can have joy when you're going through the tribulation, when you're going through the hard things of life, when you're going through persecution and all. You can have joy. How do you explain that? How do you explain that a babe comes in a manger? From a woman who's never had sex. How do you explain that to our intelligent people today that have a jillion books that they write, make all kinds of money, and wealthy? They're, they're living off the stupidity of people. He said, is it, is it all dumb and all? He says, no, it's limited. Because none of that can give you joy and peace. None of it. So what do you mean, a baby? Uh, come on, let me psychologically try to figure this out. That, that, that's impossible. Not with God. Because He's God, you're not. Oh, Jesus goes, dies on the cross and wipes away every sin of all mankind? Yeah, try to explain that to somebody that's very intelligent. Yeah. That's why you will have a lot of intelligent people that are going to be in the wrong place at the end of life. So I would not get flabbergasted or get all excited about, oh, there's that word, about, about get all, all, I'm using a different context, you know, get excited about it, okay, I, I, I'm not, you know, going, you know, uh, uh, people that are intelligent and all, all their knowledge, oh man, I've had people listen to uh, some preachers that, oh man, he's, oh, he, he just gets me so in awe, I mean, uh, you can learn this, he, he's so knowledgeable, that doesn't impress me. He may have more knowledge than I have in the sense realm. But you know what? I've got the wisdom of God that far surpasses a person who leans on his wisdom. So do you. So do you. And the wisdom that God gives me is the wisdom that changes my life. That wisdom doesn't change their life. The wisdom of God changes my life. And it keeps you in a place of humility. 
And the humility is this. I don't know everything, but I'm seeking to know Him. He's the one that knows everything. He created everything. And guess what? You were not, you and I were not around when He created. And you know what? When we were gone, He's still going to be the creator. That's the one that I serve. Bow your heads. Close your eyes.